I died on that Tower of Rock. It's called the Totem Pole. But I was reborn. And that massive brain injury that you see there, that was the best thing that ever happened to me. It changed me in a profound way and set in motion an unstoppable train of ideas about risk and the dignity that it can bring. I'm taking a risk right now talking to you today. You see, my acquired brain injury means that besides my paralysis, I have memory problems and word-finding difficulties, hence the paper notes here. Every day is like sitting an exam, and everything takes longer, including my speech. So I invite you to slow down and bear with me, because I'm going to take you on an incredible adventure. Um, I'm, here's where I throw away my stick, metaphorically speaking, and tell you about a risk that I took that changed my life, and how taking an even bigger risk 18 years later is the reason why I'm standing on this stage today. For a kid growing up near Manchester in the 1980s, there were not a lot of prospects. I was never any good academically, and every time I went on a cross-country run, I would vomit. But then a kindly teacher took some of us bad lads rock climbing. And you know, when I first touched a rock face at age 15, it was love at first sight. And as I ran my fingers across the rock's grainy surface, I became alive. It spoke to me in a language that I already knew. The rock became a part of me. It was a place where I found joy and connection to the world. And so began my journey to the mountains. I climbed many of the world's most difficult big walls, sometimes taking weeks to ascend. From Patagonia to Baffin Island, from the Himalayas to the Karakoram Mountains, the mountain is where I became my best self. Then, on a Friday the 13th in 1998, all that came crashing down. My partner, Celia Bull, and I were attempting to climb the most slender sea stack in the world, the Totem Pole. It stands off a remote coastline in southern Tasmania. It's 65 meters high, but only four meters wide. It's so slender that it sways slightly when you're standing on top of it. But on this occasion, we never got to climb it. A rock, the exact dimensions of a laptop computer came sliding into my skull from 25 meters. And it resulted in a a devastating brain injury. I came around, upside down, hanging on the rope, with blood literally pouring out of my head into the sea. It then took Celia three hours to haul me 30 meters up to a ledge and make me safe. But she then had to leave me alone and extricate herself off the totem pole and run seven kilometers back to a ranger station for help. And after 10 hours and a dramatic helicopter rescue, I was stretched through the hospital doors where the surgeon worked through the dead of night to repair a gaping hole in my skull. Um, with that falling rock, at once I became epileptic, hemiplegic, and aphasic, really meaning that I was paralyzed on one side, 
unable to talk and unable to understand language. I spent an entire year in hospital where I had to use a wheelchair and learn how to walk again and talk again and feed and dress myself again. I thought that I would never go back to the mountains again, never be able to do what made me feel whole. And this made me, well, despondent. I mean, mountaineering was where I became alive before my accident. And I just wanted to get back to that glorious life of adventure. So I worked out a way. I hobbled around the rehab centre at maybe 100 metres. And then building up over years, I climbed taller and taller hills. I should say that for every hill I did climb, I must have failed on two. But seven years later, I was standing, well, maybe more like leaning, on top of Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in Africa. And that was one of the greatest moments of my life. In the years that followed Kilimanjaro, I've cycled to my Everest, ridden for 43 days on a tandem trike with my visually impaired friend and others um, from the lowest point to the highest point in Australia. I've traversed desert mountain ranges with an old disabled team and even led rock climbs again, you know, going first up the rock face. It's a beautiful thing to feel that joy and connection again, especially with like-minded and like-bodied people. But you know, now, every time I go on my expeditions, there are people in the community who say that we're taking too many risks. And here's where I want us to start considering the importance of taking risks in our lives and how we build capacity to try new things I mean, by taking risks, we build resilience and courage, growing our abilities to face the challenges that life will inevitably bring us. This is an established and accepted part of raising children. Let them take risks and they'll grow in confidence and become more independent. But what happens if someone is not given those opportunities ever. Conversely, what happens if someone has been given all those opportunities, like I was, and then one day they wake up to find that they're denied them? I mean, I never considered how important the freedom to take a risk was. When I say risky, I really mean to make an informed decision until that rock hit me on the head. And accepting that someone who has a disability can make decisions and embrace risk might make some non-disabled folk feel uncomfortable. But it is this independence that allows us to have agency over our lives and take risks, whether it be emotional, romantic, financial, or physical. Now, I reckon I know what some of you are thinking. How can we take this guy seriously? He smashed himself up and nearly died climbing, and, and here he is lecturing us on risk. <laughs> and I acknowledge that I might have different parameters regarding risk and risk mitigation to many people. But as accomplished climbers, we do put in mitigating factors. We develop skills and experience over years and we make informed decisions. And accidents still happen. 
And I understand that most people are scared by risk and try to avoid it at all costs. But what if I said that you can't protect people from life? In acquiring a disability myself, I learned that disabled people are actively discouraged from making decisions about our own lives, weighing up the pros and cons and deciding what it's worth to us. It is this opportunity to take action and sometimes even to make a mistake that I'm talking about here. I mean, decision making and risk mitigation are muscles that get bigger with practice and support. So let's consider my story for a minute. What if on leaving rehab, someone said to me that going for a walk was just too dangerous or that I might get wet or cold? Do you think that I would have ever cycled to Mount Everest? What seems like a simple act of protecting somebody from the world can sometimes have far-reaching consequences. And I talk to people now about this as being called the dignity of risk, the right to make decisions in our own lives. I run workshops to nurture courage and foster inclusion in society. Because of my status as a well-known climber before my accident, I was supported by my community and nobody questioned my competence. I was able to marry, to migrate across the world, to have children, to build a house then also to experience heartache, dislocation and divorce. It was also a risk and a decision for me to begin again, to love again, to expand my family, to go all in again. But it's a very different situation for many people with disability. And I wanted to challenge this in a way that was visible. I wanted to finish the journey that I'd started almost two decades before to complete my climb of the totem pole. In my mind and in my heart, I can't overstate how important this journey was to me. I'd come to a place of peace with the consequences of the accident, but it felt so unfinished. Can you imagine, can you comprehend what it meant to me now as a disabled person? And if I came to you with a deep knowing and a way to close this yawning gap to, to feel whole again, would you say no? Or would you Give me a yes, how can we help? I mean, notice what your first reaction was when I told you that I wanted to climb the totem pole again as a person with a brain injury acquired from that very same place. Was your reaction one of shock or disbelief or perhaps one of he hesitation? Or was it a full-bodied yes? I mean, as soon as I revealed my plans to my friends, everybody got on board, and it was nine people that helped me plan a new method whereby I could climb the totem pole um, with, with only half a body and carry ropes and water and um, climbing equipment out to the end of the cape. And as I clipped into that abseil rope, my mountaineer's brain knew exactly what to do. But it was a very emotional climb for me, though. 
I caressed the rock scar where the rock had fallen from. And as I clambered onto that ledge, I swear that I could hear Celia screaming at me from 18 years before. You're going to have to help me here if we're going to get you out of this. And after 126 one arm pull ups up that rope, I finally clambered onto the summit and an 18 year loop or circle was finally closed. Now, that climb of the totem pole was the epitome of the dignity of risk. Those nine friends around me included Steve, who had made the first free ascent of the totem pole. Um, plus exped experienced expedition guides. Without that team, it would have been impossible for me to realize this long-held dream. There's a ripple effect, I hope, from sharing what I've learned about confronting the totem pole all those years later. But that ripple needs to move beyond each of us here today. So I ask you to be the rope, be the person that leads the climb, be the driver, the planner, the, the team maker. Be on my team and the team of other people with disability who all want the dignity that comes from taking a risk. For only then can we begin to create a more inclusive society that has a place for everybody. Thank you. Thank you.